Welcome to today's program titled Federal COVID-19 Emergency Temporary Standards. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. If you would like to stay on after the presentation, we will answer as many questions as we can at that time. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down as it will not be reread, and this is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials along with the CLE attendance form will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. This presentation has been prepared by Cypher Shaw LLP for informational purposes only. The material discussed during this webinar should not be construed as legal advice or a legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The content is intended for general information purposes only, and you are urged to consult a lawyer concerning your own situation and any specific legal questions you may have. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our first speaker for today's program. Adam, please go ahead. Thank you, Kate, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining our webinar. If we go on to the next slide. My name is Adam Young. I'm a partner here in the CIFAR Chicago office. I'm a member of the Labor and Employment and Workplace Safety Teams. We have Daniel Bierenbaum, an associate in our Chicago team, on the line as well. Um, Dan and I are based here in Chicago, um, but our Workplace Safety Team does have attorneys in three cities on the East Coast and three cities on the West Coast. So we, we have a strong national footprint as a group, and we have a growing national practice in the healthcare industry and healthcare services industry. Um, we're gonna be providing this PowerPoint to you online. If you want a copy of it, it will be available. Um, if you're unable to find it, please feel free to email Dan and me. Also, if you have any questions during this presentation, please put them in the Q&A feature and we'll try to address them either during the presentation or afterwards. Uh, feel free to email Dan and me with, with any question that you have. If you have a question you want to be anonymous, say you're just asking for a friend, you know, that's fine too. Um, we're happy to answer any questions that you have. We go on to the third slide. All right, so federal OSHA sat on its hands for 16 months or so of the pandemic, didn't issue any regulations. The Biden administration said this was a big priority for them. They put out COVID guidance right when they took, took office and they planned an emergency temporary standard to be released in March. That got pushed back several times, and now they did release the emergency temporary standard, but they limited it just to healthcare and related healthcare services. Um, there's guidance out there for other types of employers, um, but if you're listening to this web webinar and you're not in healthcare or healthcare-related services, nursing homes, things of that nature, we're happy to talk to you about OSHA enforcement and guidance outside of this industry, but th this webinar won't be very effective for you. Um, you know, our, our general thoughts is that OSHA missed the crisis. Healthcare was one of the first employers to get their populations vaccinated and heavily vaccinated. There's still arguably health risks that are out there, but um, the, the real time for the emergency temporary standard probably had passed before this was issued. Um, and still the industry would be one of the higher risks in the sense that there's known COVID positive individuals there and, and contagious individuals. Um, <clears throat> All right, so because this was passed as an emergency temporary standard, it's effective for only six months. It'll automatically expire at that time unless it's renewed. 23 states operate OSHA state plans here near Chicago, Michigan, and Indiana are both, both state plan states. Um, they were required to adopt their own emergency temporary standard within 30 days. Most states um, have chosen to just adopt the federal standard. If you have any questions about a specific OSHA state plan, you know, feel free to reach out to us. What we're gonna be discussing here is this federal standard that's, that's been adopted by most states. Um, the effective date was June 21st, 2021, so it should be effective through, through December of 2021. 21. Um, and there's two different compliance dates. Um, one is July 6th, that's everything that's in the standard, you gotta comply with by July 6th except for a few things that Dan's gonna talk about on physical barriers, ventilation, and training, and then those physical barriers, ventilation, training, those become effective on, on July 21st. Um, the OSHA has also issued a national emphasis program which addresses how it's going to enforce this standard and enforce COVID issues against employers um, that Dan will talk about in some detail. And there's also an enforcement directive 
Um, if you have questions about specific regulations in the ETS, there's frequently asked questions online, and I'll reference some of those as well. If we go on to the next slide. Uh, you know, as I said, this, this applies to settings in healthcare settings and healthcare support services settings. Um, it's not applicable to pharmacies and not settings outside of a hospital where all the employees are fully vaccinated and everyone is screened for COVID-19 before coming there. So physical therapy or something like that, if you're, you're doing the screening, it's not going to apply in that type of ser service or setting. Um, it doesn't apply to healthcare support services that are not performed in the healthcare setting. And OSHA explains that that's off-site services. So if you have on-site support services like laundry or medical billing, the standard would apply in those services where they're on-site at a healthcare facility like a hospital. Key carve-out that's provided is in well-defined areas where there's no reasonable expectation that any person with suspected or confirmed COVID will be present, the PPE, the distancing, and the physical barriers are not required for employees who are fully vaccinated. So can we have a conference room meeting with our executives uh, from, from the hospital. Can we have sit down with a conference room? We're all vaccinated. Do we need to wear masks? And the answer is there's a carve out in this ETS that, that you wouldn't have to. Um, a reasonable expectation uh, that, that no one with COVID is going to be present, that's going to be based on vaccine verification. That's going to be based on wellness screenings. That's how you're going to have that reasonable expectation. Go on to slide five, please. All right. So it, this standard requires a written plan to be developed. Um, most of our clients have written COVID plans that have existed for 16 months now. Sometimes they're in a lot of different pieces. You need to have one document that's called a written plan and it needs to have these elements. Um, this would be having a designated COVID-19 coordinator, having a workplace specific hazard assessment. If you haven't done a hazard assessment, you don't know how to do a hazard assessment, it's explained in the FAQs. Um, to the to the standard, uh, you have to have procedures for determining employees' vaccination status. Um, those, those are vaccine verification procedures. It doesn't say you have to review vaccine cards. That's an option. Uh, it doesn't provide exactly how you have to do that. Just that you have to do. Um, you know the exemption from those controls that we talked about before. The PPE, the physical distancing is based on vaccination status. So it's very important that you do verify um, to be able to to have that defense and that, that limitation on, on usage of PPE and physical distancing and barriers. Um, you also need to have input from employees and a union uh, in your plan. So that's kind of like safety committee requirements uh, that exist in 10 states or so. And you also have to have policies to coordinate with other employers that come on site. Um, that's an area where a lot of employers did not have a written policy addressing that. So a key thing to, to zoom in on and address. Um, we got a couple questions, you know, would this apply to an eye clinic separate from a hospital setting? Uh, and the answer is, if you don't have the reasonable belief that someone's going to have COVID and all the employees are, are vaccinated, then no, it wouldn't apply. Um, and how would you have that reasonable belief? You'd have to do wellness screenings and ask people ahead of time to make sure that they're not contagious for COVID. We're coming in to, to get those eye treatments. Um, all right, if we go on to the next slide, slide six, please. This is employee screening. So very important that employers do wellness screenings of employees. That's how you get rid of contagious people. Um, that's how you get rid of the people who could transmit COVID-19, typically unvaccinated. Um, so you have to keep doing the wellness checks, but the employer representative now doesn't have to be the one doing the screening. And you do not, because of that, you don't have to do temperature checks. Employees can self-monitor. Um, and there's no requirement they, they submit specific results. A lot of clients are doing that. You know, Cyfarth is still doing that, for instance. If you log on to our system, you have to click to uh, assert that you don't have certain symptoms um, to be able to, to work on site. Um, but there's no requirement in here that you do that or you do it in any form. So whatever works best for you as an employer, you can choose. Um, employees are also required to notify the employer of a COVID positive test, of a positive diagnosis or symptoms. And what's really important here is what constitutes COVID symptoms is much narrower than that list of 15 symptoms that existed from, from uh, the CDC that had everything from muscle pain to um, shortness of breath on it. Here, there's only two. One is recent loss of taste and or smell with no other explanation. And the number two is three symptoms combined and you gotta have all of them. 
fever, unexplained cough, and associated shortness of breath. So those are the symptoms that, that are applicable in this, in this regulation. That's what needs to be reported, and that's going to be the basis for some of the medical removal provisions that Dan's going to speak about in more detail. Um, all right, so if we go on to the next slide. So patient and visitor screening. Unlike with employees, you cannot rely on patients, clients, visitors to self-screen. Uh, the regulations are very specific. You got to limit and monitor the points of entry. You got to screen and triage patients, residents, delivery people. We've gotten the question, well, could we just put up a sign that says don't come in if you have these symptoms? The answer is no. That's not what this regulation says. It says you got to have uh, a screening and triaging method in place. And the, the intent of the reg, as you can read through in the FAQs, is there's someone from you or your representative doing that, doing that screening. Uh, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the standard also directs employers to the CDC guidance for infection prevention and for isolation protocols. And what the standard directs that you need to use and implement that CDC guidance. So it effectively creates an evolving mandate to follow the guidance to the extent the guidance uh, changes and to comply with that. Um, and somebody asked me to repeat the COVID symptoms again. That's There's two, two that they zoom in on, recent loss of taste or smell with no other explanation, or three symptoms they put together. Fever that's 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, and new unexplained cough associated with shortness of breath. So those are the, the symptoms that are in this reg. Um, and uh, when we're talking about patient or, and visitor isolation and and procedures, you got to keep up with those CDC guidance as it's changing. They're essentially incorporated into this reg, and OSHA is going to, if there's some big changes out there from the CDC and their infection prevention and control recommendations, they want employers to track that. All right, let's go on to slide eight. Record keeping. So there's several distinct record keeping rules that are new that are in this standard. One, you have that written plan, you have to keep a copy of it, and you have to keep all versions that you create during the pandemic. Um, number two, you have to create a new document that wasn't required before by OSHA. It's the COVID-19 log. Most of our clients who are big healthcare facilities are already keeping this type of, of log. If you have 10 employees, and not just at the work site, but nationally, that's the, an aggregate of counts 10 employees, then you're required to keep and maintain and preserve one of these logs the whole time this emergency temporary standard is in effect. It lists all employees who test positive for COVID-19. Um, an employee is, is anyone, you know, whose work is directed by the employer, um, and it doesn't have to be work-related. It can be literally any COVID case, the person, you know, we may have no indication that they got it at work, we may think that they got it at home, they may have told us they got it at home, still needs to be on this COVID-19 log. And this is separate and distinct from an OSHA 300 log of injuries and illnesses, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, an OSHA 300 log is only going to be the cases that are work-related meaning where it's more likely than not that an employee contracted COVID-19 at work. If you have a positive COVID case, it has to go on your COVID-19 log. You then also have to do that work-relatedness analysis. And we have a decision tree that we put together on how to do that process, how to, how to think about it. Um, you know, was there close contact at work? When was the employee working? When did the employee get sick? There's you know, 14 or 15 things to think about on that. I kind of take you through how to come to a work-relatedness determination. We do represent healthcare facilities that have been cited for record keeping violations. So that, that OSHA 300 log requirement is important. Apart from recording, there's also a reporting obligation. OSHA requires employers to report serious injuries and illnesses by calling in OSHA. Um, the general rule is if you have a hospitalization, so a serious injury or illness that results in a hospitalization, employers have to report that within 24 hours of the accident or incident. Uh, but only if the hospitalization occurs within 24 hours of the accident or incident. And OSHA gets rid of that requirement in the CTS. They say, well, if you have someone who got COVID at work and it's work-related, you need to call that in within 24 hours of learning about the hospitalization. Um, the same is true of fatalities. If one of your employees dies of COVID-19 and you determine that to be work-related, then you're required to report it, meaning call in to OSHA, even if it's more than 30 days since that person would have contracted COVID-19 at work. Um, but again, that recording and reporting outside of this COVID log 
in your OSHA 300 log or reporting, meaning calling to OSHA, is only going to be for work-related COVID-19 illnesses. Most of the time, if you have a global pandemic going on, we don't know where someone got COVID-19, and our analysis is going to be that those instances are not more likely than not work-related. So that's something to keep in mind, and we're happy to answer those questions. And I'm going to turn things over to Dan for the next slide. And uh, Dan, do you have the, the CLE code? Yes, thank you, Adam. The CLE code for today is SS, as in Cypher Shaw, 8325. That's SS8325. Um, thank you, Adam. Uh, so turning now to uh, some of these requirements that we may be more familiar with, uh, uh, the face mask and PP requirements in the new ETS, um, we're seeing a little bit more of stricter enforcement on this than, than some um, initial perhaps leniency that, that OSHA gave in the early days of this pandemic. When, when this first happened, obviously, N95s were in short supply and, and OSHA almost on a, felt like a weekly basis was issuing uh, guidelines and recommendations about uh, what, what sort of face mask would be allowed. Um, the new ETS uh, scales all of that enforcement guidance back and now requires that face masks be FDA cleared, um, or in other words, not KN95s, and that they're required when working indoors. Um, there are exceptions um, that you see on the slide here for face mask use, and uh, I think we saw a question regarding dental offices. Um, you know, there's a carve out here that if it's necessary to see the mouth of the person, then um, then face masks aren't necessary. And in terms of providing care, dental care, I think uh, I, I think it would logically make sense that that sort of situation would fall into that carve out. Um, uh, and then, and then as well, there's a, there are carve outs in the ETS regarding getting uh, sufficient uh, 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 documentation regarding vaccination status for employees in, in, in excusing face mask use. Um, we do have a question regarding um, uh, whether uh, a one-time verification is sufficient and what sort of specific enforcement um, is expected uh, from from this verification. Uh, uh, requirement, and I will uh, let the group know, and we recently blogged about this on our website, that OSHA has put out inspection uh, enforcement guidelines for its compliance officers. And in terms of the, the verification requirement, um, surprisingly, OSHA gives employers some wide leniency, and I think they recognize that um, there's been pushback uh, among employees in, in providing this sort of information. Um, so OSHA, OSHA doesn't really set specific uh, standards for what employers have to do. They can choose to verbally ask the employee and document the status. They can keep photocopies of a vaccination card. Um, they can get some sort of other evidence, so like a letter from a physician or vaccination provider, um, and, and be ready to prepare to, to turn that over to the compliance officers. But the compliance officers have been instructed that if they, they don't see that sort of evidence or otherwise become aware that um, employers are asking their employees of their vaccination status that they're otherwise authorized to um, to issue a citation. Um, you'll also see uh, down at the bottom um, respirators and other uh, PPE that's required for exposure to people with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. I think given the scope of this presentation, it's it's um, you know there's a whole mini respiratory standard even separate than the ETS. Um, that that discusses those sorts of obligations, and um, for purposes of time, we can't necessarily get into the ins and outs and uh, intricacies of that. But um, it is certainly the most comprehensive part, I believe, of the ETS, given that they they've implemented this new mini respiratory standard, and uh, and it's it's obviously worth everyone here to review that. And, and if any questions arise, we're happy to to answer those as well. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, sanitation and hygiene, again, something we're probably all familiar with at this point, um, but now written into uh, the ETS. Um, following the CDC's guidelines regarding disinfecting surfaces and cleaning high-touch surfaces at least once a day, um, and following manufacturer's uh, instructions, um, and then also implementing sanitation and hygiene requirements uh, for when there's um, individuals uh, who are COVID-19 positive in the workplace within the last 24 hours. Um, so everything you're seeing on the slide probably isn't brand new, but uh, again, 
uh, the issue here is just, uh, you know, from a, an OSHA enforcement uh, perspective now, it's, 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 uh, it's written into the ETS and a requirement that, that employers are going to have to follow. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, ventilation, um, and Adam talked about this briefly, the compliance deadline for this date, I believe, is next week, July 21st. Um, um, and I would, I would hope that everyone on this call is, is, uh, has already considered their ventilation systems and, and has reviewed this as well. Um, but ensuring that your HVAC systems are used in accordance with your manufacturer's instructions and that the air circulated and number of air changes are, are maximized to the extent appropriate. Um, but this is one of the uh, physical requirements of the ETS that, that employers are going to have to comply with uh, within the next week. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the medical removal provisions, I think, are, are some of the more controversial provisions of the new ETS, which I'll talk about shortly due to the pay requirements. But essentially, these new requirements require that um, employees are, are immediately removed from work if COVID positive. And, and not returned until they meet the return to work criteria. Um, this is something that's that's consistently changing um, as the CDC gathers more information regarding return to work. Um, I, looking at it today, there's now three categories just to determine which return to work protocols apply. Um, and essentially it involves focusing on employees and whether they, um, that, that the severity of their symptoms uh, whether they're mild, or excuse me, whether they're asymptomatic, mild to moderate symptomatic, or have severe illness. And it also focuses on whether the employee is severely immunocompromised or not. And depending on how those two answers, those two questions get answered, that will dictate essentially when the employee can return to work. Um, but not clearly not as easy as it used to be, in, in, at least in the early days when it was simply 14 days or whatever the case may be, and it's just kept evolving. So um, it's just going to become a critical question because, uh, again, as I'll talk about shortly, while the employees are removed from work, the uh, employers are responsible for appropriately paying those employees uh, the correct amount of compensation. And the longer that goes on, um, obviously, the more money these employees will accrue and the more potential um, employers have reliability if they don't, you know, adequately pay or calculate the pay correct for a certain week, it opens them up to citations that way. Um, and, and in addition to the return to work criteria, also, uh, as you see, negative P PCR tests or, or um, other evidence will allow the employees to return to work um, immediately. Um, so that's, a, that's for COVID positive employees. And then for exposed employees as well, um, there's a medical removal requirement. Um, so, you know, even even if um, they don't they don't contract COVID, if they are exposed, they have to be removed as well. Um, and then there's a little section here at the bottom about the benefits that are owed. Um, but I think I'll ask to go to the next slide, which which discusses it in more detail. So the the medical removal benefits, by far, at least in my practice, has been the most controversial section. Um, as of today, there has been a lot of rumor about challenges. Uh, to the ETS, including to these medical removal benefits, and we will not be surprised if that comes uh, shortly. But as of now, we're not aware of any legal challenges currently. Um, the issue with this provision is it's generally directed at um, ensuring employees receive adequate paid uh, sick time. And obviously, this is a, an issue that is really falls outside of the purview of health and safety and is more of a wage and hour issue. And, and of course, our firm has wage and hour specialists outside of the health and safety um, um, group that, that specialize in these sorts of issues. Um, so at the risk of not getting out over uh, my skis too much or out of my wheelhouse too much, I will tell you what I know from reviewing the ETS and that employers are required to pay certain benefits to employees up to uh, $1,400 per week. After the second week uh, that an employee is out, that, that amount can get reduced um, depending on the size of the employer. If there's 500 employees or less, then that employer would only be required to pay two-thirds of the regular pay, and that's only up to, it's, it caps out at $200 a day or about $1,000 per week. So the amount of pay does get reduced, um, but that'll be dependent on the size of the employer. Um, but the issue here is that there's no really clear guidance otherwise 
or I should say any clear direction on how much employees need to be paid. Um, as I referenced earlier, OSHA's uh, uh, released inspection guidance and, and kind of leave it up in the air to say that the determination can depend on a variety of factors, including size of company, other sources of compensation, um, which could include benefits and payroll records. Um, so ultimately, you know, OSHA has been instructed to look at the rate of pay, the time worked per week, um, and the dates, but also to look at customary deductions. And, and that's really something that's going to be employer driven and known only really by the employer. Uh, the most important thing to, to realize here is that when OSHA is enforcing this, they're thinking um, with 11C, the retaliation provisions in the back of their minds. So whatever pay is given to employees for medical removal will need to be non-retaliatory in nature or otherwise um, at the same amount as someone else who may be at the same seniority or job title as that employee. Um, I think OSHA's recognized that, you know, because of the pandemic, uh, current wages may have, have been altered um, due to circumstances and, and they're instructed to interview employees who have the same job title and seniority. So the key issue will be uh, paying employees such that it's not retaliatory. Um, because OSHA has otherwise been directed to, to refer the matter to their whistleblower section um, and, and assess punitive damages if, if it's appropriate. The other thing that's interesting here is that OSHA has been directed to cite employers as a serious citation as a matter of course, even though um, it's tough to see the health and safety, you know, the serious health and safety correlation between what someone's paid when they're out of work um, and health and safety concerns, but um, obviously that's significant because um, it, it really has the potential to rack up um, at 13,000 plus each each citation. And then of course, if the citation is accepted and an employer opens themselves up for repeat liability, that as well um, really opens the door here. So um, just some inter interesting uh, uh, inspection guidance that's been issued to OSHA. And, and most of the information we're telling you today as well can be found on OSHA's website. If you go, um, they have a lot of resources regarding the ETS, um, including how they're going to enforce this, um, a sample documents, plans, sample communications, um, and it's getting constantly updated every day. Um, so I, I highly recommend everyone, you know, check that out if you haven't so far and to do so on a continuing basis because it seems each week they add more helpful materials. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the training, I'll try and shoot through real quickly. Again, this is something that will be effective next week. Um, and again, something we're probably all very familiar with, um, training on COVID-19, policies and procedures, PPE, um, health screening, sick leave policies, the, the sorts of... Uh, issues that, that we've kind of been up to date on this uh, entire time and, and rolling it out to our employees. Um, so uh, again, I mean, if we haven't already trained employees, we wanna do that um, before next week, as well as gathering documentation. Um, so that way, if OSHA shows up, um, we're ready to go and, and able to, uh, to inform compliance officers or otherwise that, that we're uh, meeting the uh, compliance obligations of the ETS. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then briefly, uh, uh, National Emphasis Program has been uh, um, released by OSHA, noting that the agency, you know, due to political pressure, union pressure, just public pressure, is going to prioritize um, inspections of COVID-19. Uh, I think it's not exaggeration to say that COVID-19, at least at a personal level, is, uh, or for most people, is, is the most significant, seems to be the most significant workplace safety and health issue that's arisen in the last few years. Um, and OSHA's treating it accordingly. So um, they're going to prioritize fatality inspections um, and then put a second priority to inspections based on complaints, um, which is we're probably all aware has, has, has dramatically increased in the last few months um, as uh, employees are becoming more savvy to their OSHA rights and, and openly, you know, contacting the agency regarding their concerns. Um, and then the enforcement directive uh, link below, these slides are all going to be distributed or, or available to you. But it's, it's worth checking that out because it, it gives you some insight on how OSHA is going to enforce this, what kind of evidence and documents they're going to gather, and also puts the employer on notice on what sort of evidence and documents they should be gathering so they're ready for an inspection. Uh, next slide, please. And I think we're right at the end here at 1230. I, I do see there's some additional questions here we haven't gotten to yet, um, and we can, we can try to. Um, but again, as Adam said, we have our offices all over the world, as this map indicates. 
um, and uh, and our workplace safety group is is coast to coast and has worked in I believe every state in the country on, on OSHA issues. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Adam to see if he has anything else to add. But appreciate everyone turning in today. Adam, anything sure, yeah, else to you. add? Thank you very much for attending, everyone. Well, we also have a blog um, for workplace safety and health um, law. That's our workplace safety blog. If you're interested in being subscribed to that blog, feel free to go on to it and, uh, and click, and they'll give you a subscription or email, uh, Dan or me, and we'd be happy to get you subscribed to that. But there are some additional questions. I answered most of them in the Q&A um, while, while Dan was presenting. Um, Dan, do you see Aaron's question, is the medical removal benefit required even if the employee's exposure occurred outside of work? My understanding would be that the answer to that is yes, but I, I'll let you answer if you think you know the answer better than me. Uh, no, that's a good question, and I, um, I believe it does as well, but we can, we can look into that and confirm that for you. Um, Okay, and then the other one was, are fully vaccinated employees eligible for benefits if they test positive, regardless of whether it was a workplace or community transmission? Um, my understanding with that is that that would be yes, but do you have any other thoughts on that, Dan? Yeah, vaccination status, I agree with you. I don't believe vaccination status one way or the other impacts the medical removal benefits. If you're vaccinated and you still get COVID, COVID and, and you have to be removed from the workplace, then your vaccination status doesn't impact that. All right. Well, if anyone else has any other additional questions, please feel free to email uh, me or Dan, and we'd be happy to get back to you. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you all for attending.